whenever I'm asked to give feedback to people in power, I'm always very careful to have them understand what the financialization of housing actually means and how it can promote stability. I, I think the furthest thing from reality is institutions distorting value. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. I'm going to hit record now, Sasha, and we'll, we'll just have some fun. Sure. Welcome back to the Tom Story Show. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Steve, I'm going to make an announcement before we introduce the guest because I've I looked into the back end uh, analytics of our YouTube channel this morning and still like 60% of the people that come here every single week aren't subscribed. And I think that's an issue. Uh, so I'm putting it out there. And here's the actual reason why. Just before I introduce our guest, Sasha, what I've learned is that to get people like Sasha to agree to come on the show, you need to have a big subscriber count and people need to show up and tell us that they're here. You know, otherwise Sasha just wouldn't have even responded to our email. So if you want better guests like Sasha, please hit the subscribe button and uh, let's get into it. So uh, Sasha Chuchus has joined the show. He's the CEO of Graybrook Securities. They are a private equity firm that invests and manages world-class real estate developments. Sasha, thank you for being here. You're welcome. I, I made an exception today. Uh, yep. Hopefully, we put the subscriber amount over the top. So, if it doesn't get to 50 50, this episode might just never air. That's what I've heard. Well, we, have, we have a lot of subscribers <laughs> at our shop. So, uh, we're doing our part. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being here. Why don't we start with a little bit of background on, uh, on you? Obviously, you're CEO of a, of a big company. You know, what's that path been like? How long have you been in that position? And and for the people that don't know what Greybrook is, can you can you break that down for us? Yeah, I'll give a, a real quick sort of uh, elevator pitch on the firm. So uh, we are a equity investor in real estate development primarily. Uh, yeah. Our market is North America, so we're not necessarily investing globally, but al although we do have investors from all over the world, uh, the business today uh, has about 150 or so people. We have been around for 20 years. I'm a co-founder and, and technically co-CEO. I have a, a, another partner, a counterpart that you wouldn't want him on your podcast anyway. <laughs> but, um, we, we've been partners for 20 years uh, and we run it together. Uh, and our, 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 our business basically is at its essence, taking individual investors primarily, we have institutions as well, but individual investors and giving them a, uh, you know, a, a, a vehicle to invest in large scale development throughout North America. Now, for people that are hearing that and thinking like, what does that actually mean? We'll get more in depth on this a little bit later, but, and tell me if I'm off on this. So, you know, we, we buy the house that I live in, right? And maybe I buy an investment condo and perhaps I had an issue with a tenant. And perhaps right now my mortgage is high, my cash flow is not great, and I decide to sell that condo and the headaches of, like we have lots of clients that are basically just like, I'm not becoming a landlord. I don't care if it makes me money. I don't want to deal with all this crap. Is this the the kind of person I guess you're looking at to say, please come invest with us? Is, is that the business model? I think so. I mean, uh, we, we do consider ourselves passive from the okay. perspective of the investor. It's obviously very active for us who do this on behalf right. of the investor. Um, I, I would say that for any investor, it's, it's great to have diversification across a number of things. So, you know, frankly, whether, you know, we fill a, a certain niche in their investment strategy being development based investment, which is different. Mm -hmm. Um, because we think of ourselves as we're in the manufacturing business, like we're manufacturing housing, the way that we make our money and our investors make their money is on the difference between what it costs me to build communities and, and what I can sell them for. Most people that are active investors are buying things that are done, completed, and, and they're extracting right. cash flow from them, you know, kind of going forward. So I think both are great strategies and, and people should try to get exposure to both. Steve, you invest in mix. Is that correct? And we haven't talked about that too much, but have like, what's the, you know, a company like yours that gives people an opportunity, I guess you can invest in a mix. Steve, you're still doing that. Yeah. I got some money in, yeah. in mortgage investment corp, but that's, I mean, then you're investing in the mortgage, right? You're not an owner in the property. basically. Right. And my understanding is that's kind of the difference. So like, what is, 
what type of properties are we dealing with here? Are we, are we funding development? Are we getting in on like purpose-built rentals to own long-term? What's the, what's the business model? Yeah, so our business model as a private equity investor is we target a certain rate of return that, that's around the kind of 20% annualized, right? So when that's your target, long-term ownership is, is not really our strategy because that typically is a single-digit type return, albeit over a long period of time. So we focus on the development piece of, mm -hmm. of investment. And we, as Steve, you pointed out, we're the equity. So we're not a lender. What that means is that we essentially, our capital along with uh, partners in some cases, will buy land and we'll take it through an entire process of entitlement approval. And in, in many cases, we'll build condo projects, communities, purpose-built rentals, mainly in the US. That's a mathematically driven thing it's not the Canada doesn't need rental it's that you know we feel that the trade-off between risk reward in the development phase of rental just isn't what it needs to be from an investor's mm -hmm. perspective but in the US we do a lot of it we're actually we with a partner called property markets group uh, are the largest developers of co-living and social commit social we call them social living but co-living and social living communities across America uh, we're in Denver, Atlanta, Nashville, um, Miami, Mo Fort Lauderdale, like multiple U.S. markets. Yeah, I'm going to take a wild guess on something here. Um, why don't the numbers work so well in Canada? Like you've been 20 years. How did development fees get to where they are today? How did this happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of being part of certain committees that that you know, governments put together to kind of try to tackle some of the issues, like most recently with the uh, affordability task force that was put together, and mm. I was a contributor to that. Mm. It's discussed often. I think you know, as it as it relates to take a place like Toronto um, or Vancouver or wherever we may be talking about in Canada, cities, not primary source of revenue, but certainly a large source of their revenue comes from new development. And, you know, budgets have increased over time. Infrastructure requirements have increased over time. And as a result of that, the fees have increased along with it. I think the flaw in the logic, and we saw this a little bit kind of in 2020, 2021 here in Toronto, I'm situated in Toronto. So here in Toronto, where you saw development charges, you know, double and triple and all these things. And I think it's because sometimes people look at the market and they say, well, look, rep prices are increasing. So, you know, our development charges should be increasing commensurately. What, you know, sometimes is being ignored is the entire cost structure is shifting, right? So if you look at the condo market today in, in Toronto, which is, you know, dead would be the best way to describe it, pre-construction. Mm -hmm. and, and logically, somebody could look at it and say, well, if you look at the stats, velocity is at, you know, 20 year lows, prices haven't moved that much. Like, like, right. listen, asking prices. So logically, well, just lower your price and, and meet the market at a lower point. It's the cost structure that makes it such that you can't, right? So development charges are a component of that. I would say that they are a disproportionately large component of that relative to other markets. Like when we operate in some of our US markets, the development charges and taxes, what I would consider municipal, federal and state or provincial in our case, all in is a fraction of the of the level that we see here. Like we're wholly close to a third of mm -hmm. the cost being allocated towards sort of government fees and 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 charges in the U.S. You know, we might be it, it varies market to market, but you could be like six percent. You know, so that's a big that's a big difference, and you know, it really impacts your ability to deliver housing at a more affordable uh, price, obviously. And, and that's you've made that decision in your company that the capital is being allocated in different places than Canada. And although I know we've said we're in a housing crisis here for, I mean, forever, it just seems like no one, at least on the government side, is actually taking it seriously. Like it like this is just a, a great example, right? Like you're you're part of this, but there's many other people in similar situations that could be building more housing here and choose not to simply because the numbers don't pencil. And and you're building up, you know, other communities in 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 the states instead of focusing on Canada because it just economically for you guys wouldn't make sense. Like that's yeah. that's an issue, right? Like long term. 
It is. I, I think, you know, and we, and, you know, to be clear, we do invest a lot as well here yeah. in Canada, but I think what you've characterized is right. I, I don't know that it comes from a place of everybody knowing all the facts and understanding all the different sides of the equation and just taking a hard position that, you know, they're, they're not moving. I think that a lot of times there's a misunderstanding of the economics of development, right? Mm -hmm. And rental's a great example of this, right? I, I've sat in these meetings and talked about and heard the constant beating drum of we need more rental, we need more rental, we need more rental. And then I, I would say, you know, has anybody stopped to think about why there's no rental? Like, do you think that the development community and the investment community has, um, it's not occurred to them that in a city the size of Toronto, for example, we need rental? Of, of okay. course it's occurred to us. The, the reason um, is how it's financed uh, relative to, let's say, condo. Um, it, it, it has to do with, you know, the proportion of equity to debt that's required in a rental building versus the uh, proportion of equity to debt that's required in a condo project. And the, the simplest way to put it is when you're doing a condo and you have the pre-construction sales requirement, legislatively, you can use purchaser deposits as a source of financing, thereby reducing the aggregate amount of equity that needs to be put in place. In a rental building, you don't have that, right? So if the bank's only going to give you hypothetically 70% loan to cost on a, on a building, uh, the 30% has to be equity. In the case of a condo, it's something less than that because the delta is being made up of you know, use of purchaser deposits under the right circumstances. So when you, when you write half the equity check, and then when you look at how these things make money, if you're a developer... When you build a purpose-built rental building, the way they're typically valued is you have a, a rental rate, right? So what's somebody paying per foot? And you're selling it usually at a cap rate, or at least you're valuing it and refinancing yeah. it as something called a cap rate. So at that cap rate, if you take you know, a $4.50 a foot uh, lease rate and you cap that at four, for example, which might be like a Toronto might be a little less than that, but you know, for an example, that's probably on a per square foot equivalent still way less than what you'd sell a condo for. Yeah. So in a rental context, you're writing two times the equity check and you're getting not as much of the revenue and the widget you're building is virtually the same. So, you know, you can see why that math doesn't work as well. Why is there more of that today that you're probably reading and seeing? It's a combination of two things in my mind. One is the market for a condo isn't there. So people that need to move projects forward because of, you know, cost constraints and other things, they're going to look at this and say, okay, well, it's better than not doing anything and, and, and kind of waiting and just incurring interest costs and things like that. The second is that some of the players that like to do purpose-built rental and own them are uh, pension funds and large institutional investors who aren't necessarily... They, they don't really care as much about their short term sort of uh, development margin. They need these assets as part of their portfolio long term because they're a good, reliable source of income. And if you can't buy them, right, because there's very few of these things that trade, right? Uh, there's a lot of older stock that trades, but like the brand new, if somebody had a brand new rental building in the middle of Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary, like they're not selling it. So the pension funds, in order to be able to get this product in their portfolio, have resorted to having to build them. So they're willing to take less return on the development portion in order to have these things in their portfolio long term. For people like us that are just looking for that private equity return, that trade-off doesn't work, right? We're, if if we, we have the choice between doing a condo and making the type of return that that we need for our, our capital base versus a rental making significantly less that that's not that compelling for us. And now condos are having trouble selling right now. So what's, what's been the adjustment on your side of things over the last two years, as you classified it perfectly, the pre-construction market is dead, you know, let alone the resale market, which is just, it's got a little heartbeat. It's moving along, but pre-con is, is not happening now. Have have you found this? You know, as someone that's looking for opportunities for your for your investors, uh, challenging the last little while. 
Yeah, I mean, it, ha it has. I mean, like, first, I think if you look at the dichotomy of who buys pre-construction versus who buys uh, resale, they're, they're mm -hmm. different. I think that I, and I would contend that a resale is predominantly end user driven. Like there are people that are looking to buy a place to live when they start seeing a, a light at the end of the tunnel relative to interest rates and the trajectory of interest rates and they have an actual need, right? Like they, they need housing, they're going to move first. And, and that's why we're starting to see some life in the resale market particularly on the low rise side in the markets we operate in. And I think it'll get to the high rise side on in pre-construction. It's a little bit different. Um, pre-construction low rise, right? So things like townhouses, single family home, again, more end user driven because that purchase is like, I'm buying something today and I'm moving in, in 12 to 16, 18 months. Like people make life decisions on that type of interval. So you're getting a lot of end users. And so you're starting to see life in the pre-construction low rise market because again same reason that we're seeing in the resale market pre-construction high rise however is primarily investor driven right you're you're buying something to uh four or five or six years from now take possession of and rent or sell whatever your strategy may be i think that those types of uh buyers who are investors are suffering from what every investor and every asset class in the world will when things aren't going well is there's a psychology to it and people need to have confidence and they need to see the market tangibly starting to improve before they get confident enough because you're buying something on the basis of future growth right so you're only going to do that if you believe in the future growth and and i think that that's inevitably going to return but in the meantime Hey agents, a clean and easy to manage real estate website is a must. Go to realtyninja.com slash Tom right now and start your site totally for free and pay nothing until you launch. And then when it is your time to go live, you will save 20% off of your entire first year just for signing up at realtyninja.com slash Tom. You know, it has been difficult. And to answer your question as to what people like us do, I think we're, we're, we're patient in the sense that, you know, we're not just going to convert and do rental buildings because we think there's more of an opportunity, even at a crappier return, like for what our mandate is, mm -hmm. because we believe that this is a point in time and we can point even directly to the conditions that are causing this disruption. Like I, I find myself saying this a lot out of all the problems to have, the worst one is that you don't have enough demand for your widget. Okay, so our widget being housing, that is not a problem. Like there is more than enough demand for, for housing in Canada. There's a housing shortage, in fact, right? So that scarcity exists. If you take that off the table, now we're dealing with conditions at different points in time. And we can see very clearly that right now, macroeconomically, with interest rates as high as they are, the affordability constraints that exist, that's why everything's slow. When those begin to resolve over time, there will be a return because there's an actual need for housing. And so we've taken the position that, you know, we're going to be patient and we're going to wait rather than flip into rentals and flip into other things, because maybe it'll take me six months longer or a year longer to get to where I need to go. But I'm willing to wait because I do believe in the return of that market. And from our vantage point, you know, it's all about how you buy your properties. Like if you're buying your property in a way where you're using a lot of leverage, you've overpaid, then it's not going to be 12 months. It's going to be 24 months, 36 months or, or something longer than that. You may be forced to pivot in your strategy. If you if you bought good sites in good locations and at good price and you've managed your leverage carefully, generally speaking, you you have the ability to wait and, and, and wait for markets to get better. Would that be advice that you would give to anyone listening to this? I know you're doing this on a much potentially larger scale than, than a single investor, but there's people right now, and even on the other side that they, let's say they bought a pre-construction condo at 1400 bucks a square foot. It's now closed. They took a 6% mortgage that they got at the end of last year, which they should break and change now. And the penalty is worth it. I'll just say that. But um, they're, they've got a tenant in there. They're losing two grand a month. If if truly they were going to try to sell that property again today, even though the building is closed, they're maybe down 150 grand. Like, is it just 
you got to be patient here and and let the fundamentals come back to place. But it, it could take, you know, it could take five plus years for for those. Now I'm I'm using the extremes here. Not everyone's in that position. But yeah. do you do you do you think people should find a way to hold and and have this long term or, you know, it's not great now, so just get out and move on with your life. Yeah, I I think that um so you know in my personal view I I don't think we'll will be quite that long because the the scarcities are drastic. Like we have, you know, and we saw a couple of years back or a year and a half back when the Bank of Canada first started to kind of intimate that they may reduce rates. You saw this big pop in the market. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we didn't see that this time around because, you know, the issues are real. Like it's been another year and a half of high interest rates and that takes its toll on more than just people's real estate investments, right? Life is more expensive. Inflation has been high. Uh, cash requirements in other areas are are obviously you know uh, taking priority. So I would say that having said all that and and thinking it's a quicker return, the way that I would advise an investor, and again we, we're doing this at a different scale, like our our, our portfolio is close to forty billion dollars, right? So it's a different thing, but it doesn't it's not that different just at a micro level on, on a single property. And what I would say is that you know. The patience is a big, big help. People inevitably in equity markets and in other asset classes will sell at the wrong time almost every time um, because it's emotional. Like, it, you know, we can sit here and it's easy to talk about being very, you know, data driven and just look at facts and look at numbers and that should dictate your decision making. It's easy. It's easy to say it's different when you have your wealth and your, your retirement and, you know, your nest egg tied up in something and you get nervous. However, history will show and history has shown in the real estate asset class, particularly in Canada, that, you know, notwithstanding points of volatility, these fundamentals we keep talking about, this, this fundamental scarcity that exists have pushed prices reliably higher. And I think that if you have the ability to wait, I would advise people to wait. Yeah. If you do not, that's a whole other story, right? Like if you can't meet your monthly obligations, you know, because obviously the carry costs are high and they're higher in many cases than the rent that you can generate or whatever the case is. And you're doing that math and you're saying, look, I only have X months before I can't do this anymore. Then I do think you should, you should start looking at how you can transact. And, you know, I, I do believe there are buyers on the other end of these things. If on the other hand, you have the ability to, to be patient, uh, that would be my advice. I'm going to let Steve jump in here. He's been too quiet. It's not normal. Um, this but is I just the, this is the best way this should go. Like, <laughs> people are going to listen way longer if I'm not talking. I just I got I got one more quick question for you. And then I'm going to let Steve jump in with the next one. Is it a fair statement to make? Because I, I think we're all three of us are on the same page. There's lots of doomsdayers and negative people about real estate and they will always exist. And I and I get their opinion as well. But I think if you look over the long term and you think that prices are going to drop 30, 50, 70 percent. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It, that's my opinion. But I think it's also maybe fair to say that if you look at the last 10 years of growth, that was amazing, right? For everybody, homeowners, investors, your business, my business, Steve's business, people selling real estate, everyone involved. When the dust settles here and the Bank of Canada is done doing what they do and there's these new mortgage rules that have come into place, we'll, we'll get there at some point in this episode. Do you think it's fair to say that the next 10 years, there's just no way it can be like the last 10 years, right? Or yeah. are we all just going to wake up in 10 years from now and go, damn, it happened again? I, I think it's possible. Um, I, I would say it, it's probable because the scarcity is that profound and and it's simple math right like i mean if i have one house for every 10 people these numbers are made up but like just to illustrate the point until i get have you know eight houses for 10 people or nine houses for 10 people mm -hmm. that right. there's going to be upward pressure um and affordability is a is a challenge it's an issue but remember canada isn't you know any real estate market frankly isn't just for its it's domestic users. Like there's people that own real estate, like to own real estate, um, you know, from, from other places and, and notwithstanding there's a ban currently, like that's not going to yeah. exist forever. So I think it's possible, but what I would say is that I, I I'd rather not, you know, like, I mean, in, if I'm being honest, the last number of years, like it's been 
what what we're seeing today for me anyway has been very predictable in nature right because in 2020 2021 when in you know the pandemic we had a very uneven pandemic people have talked about that right you know so the type of people that would be typically buyers of residential real estate uh, that have the savings to do that were still working they're sitting in their living rooms they're not incurring expenses they're not going on vacation so their savings were piling up and asset values were high right the market's on fire the real estate market's on fire and money's cheap that's like a perfect storm of explosiveness and and that's what what led to the big spike that we saw from kind of 2020 to 2022 and i would say it was further exacerbated by the fact that you started to get people that maybe had plans in the future uh, starting to get FOMO and or thinking, oh, my God, if I don't get on now, if I don't get in now, I won't. It's going to run away from me and mortgage rates are as low as they're ever going to be. Hey, mom and dad, can I borrow? I, I only have X. Can I borrow Y and, and maybe get in the market now? So you had this this, you know, bit of future demand that got piled into those years. And now we're just living with the exact opposite impact when rates have to unwind and they go up and, and you have less buyers. So it's all been quite predictable, but I don't like the volatility. Like I, I'd rather, and I do, I'm very optimistic that coming out of this, people will have felt some pain. People will have seen a bit of a market that we haven't seen over the past 20, 15, 20 years, right? In terms of like, since maybe the late 90s or early 90s, right? Like a big correction. And as a result, they'll be more cautious. And I think more cautious equals a return back to the cadence of fundamentals where, you know, it was ridiculous when you could open a sales center and sell all your units in a day, right? And, you know, like, so I'd rather do that over six months or nine months or what, you know, like, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so frankly, I, I'm optimistic that the next cycle will see a good stable market, which is much better it's not about highs, it's about stability and visibility, right? That's how you can make good investment decisions. Roller coasters are for amusement parks, so let's let them stay exactly. there and let's try to I'm, All right, Steve, I'm get it. I'm terrified that people will have a, a short memory because I just look at, in my market, the short memory of the craziness of 05, 06, and then 07, and 08, the fall off. And, and it only took about 10 years, maybe eight years for everybody to go back into insanity. So I, I am worried that that, um, I guess, just they're going to forget. I think they're going to forget. There's going to be a hype again, and there's going to be a bunch of people that jump in again. And But that's what a market is. Like, let's not just pretend that that's not what happens, right? Like, there's the one thing we know for sure is this tool change, right? Oh, yeah. This is going to change. That market changed. But on your point towards, I was actually just looking at it right before uh, we started here today. I got an email, I think, from Korea. And it showed like the 10-year rolling average versus actual sales. And everybody, everybody's like, oh, the 10-year average, we're way down, we're way down. Our sales are way down. If you actually look at the average, not the 10-year rolling, but if you look at the average, it's actually not that far off of where we're at now, it's just been previous three years, two years ago, it was skewed so high up in the number of sales going on yeah. that, yeah, like there was this crazy frenzy of which, I mean, that was the high side, right? That It's not like we're seeing as low of lows as I thought we may have seen as a result of how high the highs were. I agree. Right? So I, that, that's kind of the craziness of, of the whole situation. But I want to, I want to, while I have this front of mind, because I lose thoughts really quickly. Um, while I have this front of mind, so someone in your position sounds maybe not like your company's business model because you're on the development side rather than you were saying these pension funds might be buying older buildings and, and that sort of thing. How do you struggle right now with the potential that your business could change by the stroke of a pen with government? Because just, I think, last week or the week before, uh, the NDP came out and said if they get in power, thankfully that won't happen, but if they get in power, uh, they're going to put an end to any sort of, of private equity firms putting money into any sort of affordable rentals on a resale basis, right? 
Yeah. Like how, how does, how could that change your business overnight? Uh, I, I, I don't think that they're, you know, ever going to do that. Like I, and I'll tell you why. Okay. There's a lot of, unfortunately politics is such that people like to use buzzwords and, te- you know, like where the rubber hits the road is when you sit there beyond the politician with the bureaucrats and I don't use that word with a negative connotation. That's what these people do. They're they're hired to work within the planning offices, the economic offices, and they're experts in their field. And when you sit there and 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 understand the implications of something like that, you know, it, and we have a business. So so we have a business called Gray Spring that owns apartments, right? So it's it's a separate division, but we have you know I don't know four thousand units uh, that we own across Montreal and, and different parts of Quebec as well as in, in the United States. Um, and I, I was very careful to, when I, when I am asked, whenever I'm asked to give feedback to people in power, I'm always very careful to have them understand what the financialization of housing actually means, right? And how it can promote stability. Because if you think about it in the rental space, I do not believe, I, I think the furthest thing from reality is institutions distorting value. I, I, I truly believe this because most of these people, ourselves included, just want stability and cash flow. And you know how to not get that is have erratic policies and jacking people's rents and doing all these things. It, it's actually the institu- institutionalization and why a purpose-built rental building has its place is it's not run like a micro landlord. Like I'd say the bigger problem is the the guy who owns a condo who's watching rents go up, he's got that tenant and he's like, huh, hey, I, I'm moving in. Wink, wink, right? Like, cause that, and, and then, mm-hmm. you, you know, and then six months later, he's renting it to somebody else. Like that doesn't happen. Like this type of stuff doesn't happen with big institutional investors. So I, I think that the NDP in this case, I, I hadn't, didn't hear that myself or read it, but that's because I probably wasn't paying attention. I, I, I just don't think that that ever gets to where it needs to go. And I'll give you a good example. So in the in the current administration in Ontario with the Ford administration, you know, um, part of the affordability task force, we, we had a, a lot of private sector expertise around the table very senior people that really understand this ecosystem. And we gave them like a whole bunch of recommendations. And the guy who ran it was a guy named Jake Lawrence, who's a very established uh, guy. He's a vice chair, I think at Scotia. We, his team compiled it all and said, here, this is how you fix the problem. What made it into policy was like 10% of that Mm -hmm. because it goes through the, political mechanism like these things have to pass you need to get support from multiple parties and you know like it's it's not that easy uh to so from what they say to what they do is oftentimes going to be different and i think it's not you know like once people start getting into the details they'll see pretty quickly that you can't make rules like that it's just never gonna lead to anything good um i would say how does that impact our business like it's a fact of life that we've dealt with since the day we started it, right? It, we are one of the most highly regulated development markets in the world. Um, and it's just something we've always had to work with. And, you know, we, we, we dealt with it. I'll give you a, a real example. Like we bought a property uh, in, in a municipality that was inside an urban boundary when we bought it, right? And then part of what happened this past year with the uh, green belt, scandal you know and they they decided to uh repeal all the urban boundary expansions that they you know because they 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 didn't want any more heat they're like okay forget it municipalities do whatever you want so it's like we bought something we paid 80 million dollars or whatever the number was on the premise of working within the construct of the law like we weren't taking risk we were like here's here's the boundary and we're buying it it's entitled you know and this is what it's worth and then literally overnight it's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so like, what do you do? Uh, you know, you have to be equipped to be able to deal with, um, w- with situations like this. Part of it is understanding, you know, your legal avenues. Part of it's really having an in- intimate understanding of the, uh, 
legislative environment and, and what your mechanisms are to be able to, to rectify things like that. And oftentimes, if you start with the premise that whatever you buy makes sense, forget what the rules are. You know, yeah, you got to pay attention to the rules. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if it makes logical sense, it's close to services, it's, you know, it's going to be able to deliver housing that's cheaper than another area because it doesn't have the same constraints with the site. Uh, the infrastructure can be delivered there quickly and efficiently. Like if you bought it on that basis, forgetting where the boundary is for a second, you will probably have avenues to 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 make logic prevail, whether that be through appeal, whether that be through other ways. Because at the end of the day, politicians aside, the people that that are setting the agenda and executing, that are planners, that are you know whatever, they are looking at what's required from a technical perspective. So, you know, in Ontario, we have something called the Ontario Municipal Board, or it used to be called that. Now it's called, you know, the LPAT, or I can't remember what they call it these days, but it's the appeals court, basically. And I remember back before the Conservatives came into power, you know, there was all this political rhetoric of like, well, you know, the Conservatives are cronies and the developers are going to take over and they have this LPAT, or at the time it was OMB. And 95% of the time, the OMB sides with developers and they turn it into this political fodder like that you got this group of people that are just there to serve your interests. They're basically just an appeals court. They don't give a crap about political affiliation. They're looking at the technical definitions of the policy. They're looking at the technical attributes of sites and they're making decisions on whether a development should or should not move forward strictly on a technical basis. Hey folks, Tom and his team are using a new tool from tressavideo.ca to help them explain Rico's information guide to their clients. And if you're an agent in Ontario looking to increase your transparency and trust with your clients in an easier way, you too can go to tressavideo.ca right now and get your own custom branded Rico guide explainer video that can simply be added to your email signature, put on your website or integrated into any CRM email campaigns. And if you go to tressavideo.ca right now and use the promo code TOMSHOW, you can save 20% off your purchase. So don't wait, go to tressavideo.ca right now Enter the code TOMSHOW on checkout, quickly upload your branding and receive your new video from tressavideo.ca right now. And most often developers come with strong technical arguments. That's why they bought the site in the first place, right? It meets all the requirements set out by the policy. It meets all the requirements set out by municipalities themselves in terms of delivering the type of housing that they want. And then you go to this appeals court. Why do you end up there? Because the political process ultimately is you know, objection or community objection or whatever, you end up going to the appeals route and then you're sitting there in front of a judge and you're giving them a thousand technical reasons that all meet the laws that they wrote. And then you got an opposition that's like, yeah, but like it's kind of big or it's too tall. Well, on what basis is it too yeah. tall? Does it fringe on any of the angular planes or shadows? Have all those studies been met? And we're sitting there going, yep, all, it's right here. All the technical experts, they've all said that we met these things. So you oftentimes win. So all of this to say that how does it affect your business? I, I don't think it does at all. I think it's just something that we've dealt with and will continue to deal with. Maybe there's more of a microscope on it today because people seem to be more in tune with the fact that there's a lot of policy change and all that kind of thing. But this has been the case when we started this thing in 04. It's been the case every day since. I'm curious to know, you talked about earlier how the, the new construction on the low rise side of things is still fairly active because it's, it's end user. And I think we all kind of understand why investors, at least on that side of the business, aren't coming back like they, they were previously, at least yet. You're going to have to have a few more uh, rate cuts here. I'll give you a, an example here in my business. So, you know, as of recording this, uh, I think I have seven condos on the market in downtown Toronto not at prices that people can't afford. Okay. Some in the $500,000 range, which I get 10 years ago would say crazy, would be crazy to say, but we're here today, right? We also had a house. It was a detached bungalow, a two bedroom house that was nicely done. We had 18 offers on it last week. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we talk about building housing. I have seven for sale right now that were way cheaper, half the price of what that house sold for. But there's 17 people that want more of that house and we're having issues just getting showings on the cheap stuff. And we think, well, the cheap stuff is what people want because it's less expensive, but 
the people that can afford the cheap stuff don't want the cheap stuff. You know, I'm going on a tangent here, but yeah, no, do you have any, right. th any thoughts on that? Like, is it just yeah. building more towers that sell to investors? Does this does this eventually solve things, or do we have to actually build like the townhouses and the things that people yeah. seem to want? Yeah, I, I think it's both. Um, I, I would say that, and this is, by the way, you know, going back on the urban boundary expansion thing, like there were some municipalities that said no urban boundary expansion. Not because there was any reason for it. It's the, it's their own political will. Um, and what consequence that has is that if you look at how municipalities have to meet their density targets, then if you don't have more land to include, that means that you have to intensify the land that already exists within the boundary, which means only more dense forms of housing. And what you just pointed out is not everybody wants or needs or, or, or can be accommodated by only dense forms of housing. That's why you need a combination of expansion and intensification, because it allows you to build formats of housing that are more appropriate for certain households. So having said that, you know, I, I, I think that the way I think about it is we in Toronto have had one of the, as much as we're having a, for, a housing affordability crisis that people think about from the purchase of housing, mm. we've had affordability challenges as it relates to rent for just as long a period of time. We have a very significant demand for rental in the city of Toronto. And our condo supply is largely the rental supply. Yep. So, so. I believe that you need to continue producing these high rise, rise towers because that is effectively where your rental supply comes from. And this is why you, that will help take the pressure off of rents over time. Now, why these things aren't selling is because, again, an end user isn't necessarily attracted to a 500 square foot condo. That's why you have 17 offers on the ground related home. That end user is going over there. Yeah. Even the resale market, typically it's investors that would buy a finished condo, right? They don't have to buy in pre-construction. They'll buy something that is, exists because they can start re renting and, and generating income. And there's a lot of people who do that. But the conditions today are such that that math isn't looking that hot, right? Like if you think about where interest rates have taken carry costs, relative to the the inflow of cash that you can realize the the math isn't looking as good as it once did now when interest rates come back down and now you're starting to sit there and say okay this is pretty compelling i can be cash flow positive on a on a property and if i hold it for 10 years i'll probably have some capital appreciation i think you'll start seeing people buying high rise um, but again it, it all comes down to the type of people and what's motivating them and I think what on the on the ground related side, you're getting just a lot more of the type of housing that today's families require that we're trying to accommodate. But that doesn't say that we don't need, right. you know, I think a little bit of the conception out there is like, oh, my God, look, these condos, nobody's buying them. Nobody wants them. I guarantee you, if you have a condo, you can rent it out like in a second. Oh, re renting, it's not the issue. It's finding the buyers. Correct. But that, but that to me means that the need as far as a user goes mm. is there. Like you need these things because people want to rent them. You need, you know, we have a very low vacancy rate. So we got to solve that problem too. And that's what these things do right now. It's a point in time where the ownership of them doesn't look as great as it once did. It's like, look at the office space. Okay. And this is a different, different industry, but you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, uh, is this a point in time and what do we kind of think of the future? I mean, four years ago, I get time goes quick, but I remember being in 2020 and every single uh, interview I did, people were like, OK, well, now that cities are over, like, what are you going to do? Right? And, and you're like, what? Like, OK, like we have to, again, just let's not think about this very second. And I assume at some point people will want to live in the city again. Um office has been very similar. Like at the beginning, it's like office is finished. Like, what are we going to do with offices? And it's going to take a while for them to get back to the, the occupancy levels that they once saw, but they are well on that road. Like if you look at what's happening there, like oh, what used to be like, oh, everybody can work from home as long as they want forever. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, maybe three days a week. And now it's like, well, I think you should come back full time. Like 
it, it's only a matter of time before this happens. So patience is a is a virtue in the case of real estate, typically. Um, but you know, I, I think that in your case, when you look at your world of listings and you're seeing where people are moving to, I can point to very great reasons that that's the case. But I do believe that the buyers are going to come back to this other place too. And they're both equally required for the balance of the housing supply, because we're not just solving for ownership. We're solving for places for people to rent. It's so true what you're talking about with the office space right now, because I have uh, some of my holdings are in just office REITs. And I think they slashed like more than half uh, a couple of years ago when everything started to kind of tank. Right. And now, I mean, I actually bought back in a larger chunk six months ago, and I think it's up for 40% at that point in time because rates are coming back down and companies are going, oh yeah, by the way, if things are going to get tough and employment's going up, mm, you can come back to work now. Right. Yeah. And people are like, okay, I guess I got to go back to work now. I mean, obviously we're all the, Tom talks about traffic there and how many people are going back to if work. People go back to work day. in Toronto. We're screwed. <laughs> Traffic's bad <laughs> enough. We have, we have, we, 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 we like construction season. It's now all year round. Yeah. I've, uh, I've got a theory I want to run by both of you and tell me if I'm way off on this. Uh, cause this, this is, we're going to talk about end user resale here and then how this could change the new construction market. Okay, so there's there's two things that hold people back from entering the real estate market in Canada. It is the down payment or the monthly cost of ownership. Now, Steve, I, I'm going to let you go on your rant on this. You can jump in at any point. The government has come in and solved both of these things. Okay, we know it's a short term band aid solution. It's, we know it's political. I don't care if I know the liberals did it. If anybody else did it, I still think there would be backlash. So I'll just put that out there. W- wait. Now, you, you could just say, well, this is perfect because it's telling homeowners your price won't go down and it's telling people that aren't in the market, we're going to get we're going to help you get in. And when you get in, we're just going to pump it more. So this is December 15th. We're waiting for this to happen. I believe that's closings after that date. Maybe I need to get verification on that to, to allow these new rules it, from from today until then. We'll probably see interest rates continue to go down. And then what's going to happen at the end of this year, because it happens every single year in Toronto, all the condos didn't sell are going to be taken off the market and people are going to prep for the new year. We're going to head into 2025. People have more purchasing power, let alone on the the cheaper condo stuff, but a $1.3 million house in Toronto with the new insurance uh, cap to 1.5, $1.3 million before cost you 260 minimum down payment. Now you could buy with 105. Much bigger mortgage, much bigger payments. Do you think the new 30-year AM for first-time home buyers and the insurance cap is is short-term going to bring back demand to resale, which will then... You have to, follow- break, you have to break these up. Okay, these fine. Two, two very different policies. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the, the, the first-time home buyer 30-year AM first. That will allow more first-time home buyers to enter the bottom end price point-wise of the condo market in resale. Those will start to move again because you talked about why aren't why aren't they selling? Well, the investors aren't back for that because of interest rates, and the first time home buyers just can't afford the payment or, or are being stress tested that they that they can't get in. And then when we go into twenty twenty five, and this is, this happens every year. It's not that we don't have inventory. It's like it just hasn't come yet. This flurry of activity could come back, and and at least short term could increase demand and prices, and that then the sales numbers will start ticking up. So, I mean, Sasha, first, am I, am I on to something with that? Does that make sense? It does. I, 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 you know, Tom's really chomping at the bit to jump on you there, but uh, I'll jump in first. Um, I think it does make sense. I, I, they are two different things. I believe that they will both help. Um, that that's my view. I, I, I think that, you know, some people have the luxury of, savings and some people have the luxury of uh you know being able to go to their parents or grandparents and say hey can you help me out um and and for those people you know having a 30 year am just gives them a little more of a tailwind right so they can meet the deposit requirement they can also you know make it a more palatable payment some people don't have that luxury right so now they have a mechanism through a longer amortization to be able to uh, get into the housing market. 
because they're not going to be able to meet that deposit requirement and, and having that insurability uh, now up to 1.5 because the market's moved. Like, I think, I think, you know, I mean, I think it's fair to say that that number at a million bucks versus 1.5 million bucks just opens up a, a different universe for, for people that they can kind of now ex explore. So I, I do think it will help. Um, you know, I, I always have concerns around leverage being the solution, you know, if I'm being honest, like if you look at why interest rate policy has been so difficult for Canadians, like if you look at our economy, I was saying the Fed yesterday moved 50 basis points. I think they're doing it preemptively. Like I think they're seeing some softness in the market and they're saying, hey, we better get ahead of this and, and make sure we have a solid job market. So we're going to cut our rate. I think in Canada, we're coming from behind. Like I think that there is already a lot of damage in the economy and I think that it's slowed considerably and it's been reflected in the numbers. And now we're saying, man, we better reduce rate, otherwise we're going to have other problems. And I, I think the reason there's such a difference between the two countries in how monetary policy has impacted the economy is because of the indebtedness of the households. So, you know, I think we're too indebted here in Canada. And I think that if, um, you know, we look at policy and how to make life easier for uh, people, I would focus more on the cost side of development, right? And, and going back to some of these uh, different fees and, and, and costs and things like that, like if there's compromise that can be made there to reduce that cost, the development community will deliver, you know, at the end of the day, I've said this a million times when I talk to, to policymakers, I'm like, look, I give them real examples. I'm like, well, we own something in 2018 and I could sell it for X. And then if it took me forever to get permits and there was all this red tape and all this, you know, policy and in the meantime, charges went up and development charges went up and parkland dedication went up. So when you add all that up, for us to make the same margin, which by the way, isn't us being greedy, it's the, the commercial reality of financing these things. Hmm. Now I got to charge X plus 200. So maybe had we be able to do it quicker and with some lower costs, then we could deliver it cheaper. So I think that that's where I would try to focus rather than making more debt solutions available for Canadians. Steve, go on your rant. And you've been waiting patiently. Hey, podcast listener, if you're looking to buy or sell a property in Surrey or the Fraser Valley, you have to reach out to Steve Karish, my co-host. As much as we make fun of each other on this show, the truth is, is that I do this podcast with him because he is reliable. He has an opinion. He knows what he's doing. He has a ton of experience. And although I have never personally sold a home with Steve, if I were and I was in that area, he would be my number one choice. And let's be honest with each other. As much as he has a hard exterior on the show, he's a little bit of a softy once you get digging a little bit deeper. So you can reach out to Steve in the link in the description. I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. I... Um... Okay, so I think this is the first time I'm ever, ever going to say this, probably the last time I'm ever going to say this. The 30-year AM for first-time buyers, I actually think is probably the right move. I think it's a good move. Because they don't stay there for 30 years anyways. They move after this three to five years. This is the thing, right? So right. first of all, they're first-time buyers. They got the most runway to pay this thing off, right? We've been giving 30-year mortgages to 60-year-olds for a long time. They don't got that much runway. They might have more means. So they've got a lot of runway to pay it off. They're, they have the ability to increase their skills and also their wages and, and increase income over time to help pay it off if they're going to stay there. And let's face it, they're going to be there for five to six years, maybe probably four years. And then they're going to become a second time buyer of which then they don't qualify unless they've been a good little saver and they got the 20% down for the next place. So I think it's actually overall, I, I don't like favoring one person in the society over another person. But I do understand that, you know, this is a, it's, it's a big achievement for a lot of people. I think we, people get massive satisfaction from owning real estate. And if we can help people, uh, get into that situation, it's probably one of the better government policies that could be there. However, then there's the second policy. And this is kind of what you were talking about a little bit there with the leverage. If we're now going at over a million dollars, $1.5 million. Shouldn't we ask those people to come with some skin in the game? Shouldn't they come with 20% down 
at what point, in, why do we need to help the people buying a $1.5 million house? They have to come now, I think, with 125, is it 175, $125,000, whatever it is, down payment. It's less than half, I guess, of what it was before. And now they have to be able to afford a payment on a $1.3 million mortgage. Those are not the people we needed to have help. Those are the people that are going to buy a house, maybe put a rental in downstairs. Maybe they got, cra- like, what is that, a $7,500 a month payment? At 5.5%. Yeah. At 4.5%. Yeah. Yeah. Like, those people right now don't need help. They might want a bigger house, but I don't think we should be helping those people and then pushing even more Canadians into higher levels of leverage. So personally, I'm going to go back. Thankfully, I did say the government did one good thing, but now I get to go back where I normally am and say that policy sucks. All right. Uh, okay. Let me let me just add one one more layer here. Yeah. There was a third announcement that kind of didn't get as much of the the headlines that for new construction you could get 30-year AMs as well and it, it's not just first-time home buyers anymore, it's anybody. Sasha, I'm trying to figure this out. In Toronto, I wasn't even aware you could buy new construction with less than 20% down. Am I just like in my own bubble here? Like as other parts of Canada, are people buying new construction with an insured mortgage? No, but that has to be a homeowner, Tom, right? That's not going to be an investor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But still, so you have to the, put 20% zero down. purchase policy because seven years down the road, I'm not moving no, but, in there. Right? But even if you're moving in, you have to put 20% down on most pre-con projects in Toronto. Uh, yeah. 20% would be kind of the threshold. So I, I think that, you know, policy from my vantage point, and we haven't fully gone into the details yet of of what this means but what drives that 20 percent deposit is more of of the financing requirement of of the banks right like at Mm -hmm. the end of the day you know the reason we don't have mass defaults and 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 you're reading about them in the newspaper and i think like everything when it becomes you know part of the part of the mainstream sort of reporting cycle it gets magnified. Like, it, you know, so people read about defaults and they're like, everywhere. Defaults are everywhere. Like, not not really. Like, you're, it's still a fraction of the market. Um, and ultimately, the reason is because people have a substantial amount that they've invested. Like, 20% is a lot of money. So, that what's driving the defaults, in my opinion, is not somebody doing the math and saying, okay, um, based on where I think things are going and where they are today, I'm going to walk away from 150 grand and call it a day. No, if they can close, they will close and they will hold it for a period of time. And they'll probably be in the money at some point in time. They're not just going to take a big loss. Typically the defaults are happening because we're in an environment where people just can't close. It's not that they're sitting there doing the calculus with a bag of money where if they wanted to close, they could close. And they're just doing the math and saying, no, I'm a savvy investor. I'm going to walk away. That's not happening. What's happening is people are like, I can't. I can't qualify. I don't have, you know, whatever, because interest rates are where they are. Why I'm saying this is that the reason people aren't just walking away and doing the math is because they've invested a big chunk. So that 20% requirement comes from from the, the, the financiers making them comfortable to actually advance the money to build these buildings because they know that on the other side of them, there's people who are going to close their contracts. So policy, I think, will make that change. I don't know how much it'll help because I don't see the banks and I don't see developers all of a sudden saying, yeah, don't worry about it. Put 5% down and, and you'll be fine. Because at the end of the day, if you did that, somebody's doing the calculus on the other end and they're saying, okay, five, big deal. Like I'll walk away from 25 grand if I'm 250 in the hole. That's not that, you know, so you got to be very careful about these things. And I think it would change the risk profile. So I can only speak for ourselves. We would never do that. Like we would, we would constantly have that requirement in place because it's a safeguard. Now we're, we're almost at the end here. And I want to make sure that we do actually talk about Greybrook. Um, This isn't sponsored. This is just, I'm, I'm curious because I have clients tell me all the time, I don't want to invest in another property. I just want to put my money somewhere and I'm going to get a reasonable return. And yes, for the last little bit, you could have put it in a GIC and made a good amount of money. That's not going to last forever. As rates go down, that's going to change, right? 
Um, so like, why do people invest in your company? And do you have any projects you're working with right now that people should be aware of? And we'll put all the information in the description of this episode. First, well, like, what, quick, what would, um, first what's real that? quick, um, this is not yeah. sponsored. This could it's not. be sponsored though. If you would like to, if you'd like it to be sponsored, <laughs> there are definitely it's sponsorship sponsored. opportunities. Yes. 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 This episode's not sponsored. Maybe by the time it comes out, <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. Uh, so, so that's a good question. I mean, I think what, why do people invest with us? I think it, it's not just the passive component of it. I think that's a big one. Like, I think some people like to be very active, like you said, and they want to do the work. Some people want to just say, Hey, look, I have an RSP. I have a TFSA and I invested in, I love real estate. So this would be a great place to get exposure. There's that. I think the bigger reason from my vantage point is that it, it offers a level of scale that typically you're not going to see on your own. Like as an individual investor, even if you invested in development, you invest in uh, a, a smaller scale type project. Like we have, you know, our portfolio, like I said, it's about $40 billion and the, the average size of a development is in the hundreds of, of millions, right? So scale brings with it economies of scale. And what that means in English is that, you know, there's a lot of things that you're able to achieve when you're doing it on a large scale from pricing, from, you know, negotiating loans, from, so it gives you better economics, generally speaking, and it gives people that exposure. And then the last thing I think is it diversifies them. Like if you're an individual investor and you're going into a project that's your project, you're putting, you know, you're not going to do 10 at a time, right? The way we try to work with people is, you know, if, if we met you, Tom, for example, and you said, hey, I want to invest X, whatever that number is, we would say, okay, you know what, we should give you exposure across geography, across, you know, high rise, low rise, different developers, different sub markets, different duration, um, and say, let's build a portfolio. So it might take us a year, it might take us a year and a half to deploy your intended amount of exposure. But at the end of that, you're going to be holding seven, eight, 10 developments, little pieces of each, but it gives you that diversification like a portfolio because some of them are going to be grand slams. Some of them will do exactly what we intended them and some of them will have issues. And, and that's just the nature of investing. And, and if you believe in this thesis, then if the, the more exposure you have to a greater number, you're going to average out. Like our history is for 20 years, we're at kind of a 19.2 average annual return across forever. And some of them were like way up here and some of them ended up a little less than we expected, but you're going to average out to a pretty good number. So that's what we try to do with people. And I would say today, you know, we're always, we're very picky. Like this last couple of years, we've been a lot uh, slower because, you know, sellers have not quite adjusted all their ex, but, you know, like at the end of the day, you're trying to- We know it. what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And you're sitting there and you're like, okay, well, it's not worth that. And they're like, oh yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you it is and I'll wait. And, you know, so there's there's been a little bit of that, but we've been able to identify certain opportunities that we've worked on for years that are now starting to kind of come to fruition. So we have, we have an acquisition we're making in the near term here in the GTA. What we love right now are things that have a longer fuse, as we call it. So you can buy approved sites that you can open a sales center tomorrow. You're typically paying top dollar but I don't know about you guys. I don't want to open a sales center tomorrow because there's Not nobody tomorrow. on the other end. Of it. So what we're focusing on are things that will take a, a while to gestate, you know, land that you can move through a process. And, and now you're capturing the value creation of development and, and what those entitlements are such that when you're ready to go, you're probably going to be in a very different market space. Is there a minimum investment amount that people would need to be aware of? Yeah, it's 25,000. So we set it. We set it very low um, and we try to work with people to, you know, really understand their objectives and risk tolerances, like almost like a, a, the way like a wealth manager would work with you, except they do it on a on a broader level. Like we take our little piece and we say, hey, within the construct of who you are and your overall wealth and liquidity, you should have this much in something like this. And we can build it out for you, and this is what it'll look like. So that that that's that's how we work with people. So we set the minimums low. That way, they can spread around even a hundred thousand dollars. They can spread it across four projects. Well, I don't want to take too much more of your day. This has been great. I really appreciate. I'd love to have you. Will you come back? I, I might even sponsor. 
Oh, there you go. There All right, go. Steve. <laughs> might, might even sponsor. It was a nice um, pitch, pitch. Yeah, that was great. Steve, you want to wrap it up with anything? No, this has been fun. Yeah. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if I can shut up for an episode, uh, <laughs> it's usually a pretty good episode. So I can only slam the government so much uh, and uh, and pump the market so much. I'm glad everybody <laughs> else is doing it. This is great. Well, yeah, it's that, time. You did that, say you're going on vacation soon, so maybe you were already kind of in that the, boat. The last time Steve went on vacation, he went to Disney. And when he came back, he actually broke down every cent he spent with his family on mm -hmm. the podcast. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that should place be fun. Is a, uh, you, you think you're going to spend a thousand and you come back spending 10 times. <laughs> 15 yep. times. Not that I was counting. <laughs> all right, Sasha, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will put all the information about you and your company in the description of this video. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.